Hello, everyone. My name is Phil Simon, and today I'm going to talk about platforms and planks and ecosystems, about Amazon, Facebook, Apple, and Google. But before we even go there, I want to try a little experiment. I'd like everyone to please get on up. Trust me, you will not be standing for a long time. Have a seat if you use Amazon at all. Kindle, Fire, buying books, whatever. Oh my gosh. I did this back in San Francisco, and we at least got to Facebook before most people sat down. So a few people are standing. If you use Apple, have a seat. And then there were one. How about Facebook? Do I need to go to Google? OK, so everyone in this room uses one of those four companies for business or personal reasons. And I find that fascinating. Because if I were to get up here and say, how many of you use the big four enterprise tech companies, like SAP, IBM, Oracle, and Microsoft, my hunch is that about half of you may be standing up. So what's special about these four companies? How have they redefined business? And that's today what I'm going to talk to you about. Okay. I started writing this book in April of this year. And I was about 35, 40,000 words into it when a Google alert came across. It was Eric Schmidt at the D9 conference back in May. And he said, I'll just read it, it seems to me that there are four companies that are exploiting platform strategies really well. Now, Eric Schmidt, if you don't know him, is a ridiculously smart guy. At the time, he was CEO of Google. And now he's chairman of the board. When he says something like that, you can pretty much be assured that it's true. And he called these companies the Gang of Four. And as I just proved to you, pretty much everyone is using Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. Facebook's up to, I think, 850 million, last time I checked. So what is special about these companies? And the more that I wrote and researched, the more that I realized that they weren't just popular for the sake of being popular. They really stumbled upon a new way of doing business. And that new way of doing business is the platform, which we're going to talk about. In fact, they've ushered in an entirely new age of doing business. Welcome to the age of the platform. So today, we'll talk about platforms, about planks, about ecosystems, about the gang of four. But before we talk about them, it's really important to define our terms. Google has actually evaded me on this, but I think it was Winston Churchill who said, success begins with a common understanding of terms. And if you're like me, you watch Bloomberg West and sort of tech shows on a regular basis, and it seems like there's a buzzer going off every five minutes. Someone has to just say, platform. Right? So what do we mean by platform? Okay. To me, a platform is an integrated set of planks. Now, what's a plank? Well, it's a feature. It's an app. It's a product. It's a service. Okay? And if you look at the histories of the Gang of Four, you'll realize that they've kept changing. They kept adding new products and features. Google, which we'll talk about in a bit, didn't always used to be a platform. It became one. And we're going to talk about how. Why? Well, I would argue that this isn't 1998 or 2000. There's something to be said for non-stop, one-stop shopping. Okay, we want to be able to do everything, if we can, in one place. Now, oftentimes that's not possible, right? You really can't buy books on uh, Facebook, at least not yet. But you don't really want to be on 25 or 30 or 50 different websites, right? Or have different applications, right? Even Microsoft, which was admittedly pretty late to the cloud, now has a completely web-based version of Office. Okay, so if I can stay in one browser with multiple tabs, then that's probably a good thing than trying to figure out which applications are running. Okay. Next up, these platforms are enhanced by vibrant ecosystems. And I'm talking about partners, third parties, developers, communities, users, customers. And they're taking these platforms in amazing directions. I'm going to talk about some of them later on. And a really great example I'd like to talk about is with Twitter, which I'm sure if I had everyone stand up, most of you would probably sit down as well. So here's what Twitter did. They made their API or application programming interface available for basically anyone to do anything with. And by last count, there are something like one million different apps or services based on the Twitter API. For those of you who don't know, an API is essentially two computers or devices talking to each other. Okay? So there are a million apps based off of Twitter. My hunch is that 95% of them either aren't very good, aren't very valuable, or flat out don't work. Okay? 
right, 95%. So that leaves us with 5% or 50,000 apps or services that actually have some sort of value. And there's a great example of a company called TweetDeck. Show of hands, anyone ever heard of or used TweetDeck? Great, a lot of people. And for those of you who don't know, TweetDeck allows you to make sense of your Twitter stream, right? Because if you go to my Twitter feed, it, it's a bunch of nonsense, right? You can't possibly make sense of all that. But with Hootsuite or with TweetDeck, you can segment, right? You can make sense. You can follow keywords or hashtags. You can follow what's trending. You can follow individual people, okay? So TweetDeck comes along and creates this really interesting plank, possibly for Twitter. Now, yeah, Twitter can hire developers and buy it, but think about it. Just from the number of people who raise their hands, obviously TweetDeck has an existing ecosystem, right? An existing community of users who like it. So what does Twitter do? Well, they go out and they buy TweetDeck for anywhere from 40 to $50 million. They didn't release that. So that's just one example of a company, Twitter, that makes its API available, puts it out there for basically anyone to do anything with, and then a company does something with it and they cash out for a lot of money. And today I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of these other ecosystems and how even individual people like me can contribute and be a part of those ecosystems. Okay? So ecosystems and platforms are not just the sole purview of the gang of four. I would argue that any business can build a platform. In fact, as I write in the book that hopefully all of you have, I have built my own platform. Okay? It's not nearly on the scale of Amazon, Apple, Facebook, or Google, but it is a platform. I'm not going to sell more things than Amazon Right? But I may sell more things now through Amazon. Okay. Next up, as I said, these companies have ushered in an entirely new way of doing business. The platform is a business model. Okay? Now, I don't say that lightly. In fact, when I was working on the book and playing around with titles and subtitles and images, it was obvious to me that I had stumbled upon something big. When Eric Schmidt says there are four companies that are doing something really well, <laughs> you almost fall off your, your chair, in fact. There was a fast company um, issue, I think it was last month, with uh, Bezos and Steve Jobs and Larry Page and Zuckerberg on the cover, and I was at the treadmill, on the treadmill at the gym, when I saw that on CNBC, and I, and I damn near fell off. So these companies have really done something profound. Now, I can top it talk abstractly about this, but I want to focus for a minute on Google. And as I said before, in 1998, Google wasn't a platform. Okay? It was an amazing and very profitable search engine. Okay? Who here remembers the early days of search? Lycos, AltaVista. Okay? It was terrible. Right? You never knew what you were going to get. And Google came along and said, we can do this a lot better, and, and Google became Google. Okay? But it wasn't a platform because you only used Google for search. You know, when I hear people talk about the Netflix platform, I chuckle. Because what can you build on top of Netflix? I have nothing against Netflix. I used to use it, right? <laughs> okay, but it's not a real platform, right? Okay, so why did Google change, right? Think about it. This is a company that was so successful, and you have the company fundamentally redefining the way that it does business. Right? Why did Google become a platform? Okay? Long story short, because in the age of the platform, even if you're Google, you're a single purpose company and you can be cannibalized very quickly. And Larry and Sergey and Eric Schmidt understood that exceptionally well. And I want to talk a little bit about a book by Clayton Christensen called The Innovator's Dilemma. Anyone ever heard of that? It's an amazing business text that has stood the test of time. Your business will be cannibalized. The only question is whether or not you're going to do it to yourself or someone else is going to do it to you. And Google justifiably thought, you know what, why don't we blow up our business model rather than having someone else eat our lunch? Because even though we're Google and we make billions of dollars, you can't tell me that, in the, that index search is going to stay the same. In fact, I found this statistic absolutely astonishing. I recently read that while you're on your mobile device, only 1% of your time is spent doing a traditional index search. So what else are you doing? You're texting, you're using apps, you're talking on the phone, you're playing Angry Birds, right? So Google saw that mobility is changing everything. So how do you compete in this new world? So think about changing your business model when you're that successful. It's incredible to me because not every company has done it. In fact, Google, I would argue, is the exception that proves the rule. Let's look at Microsoft for a second. Again, in the enterprise space, Microsoft is still very powerful. When I go to some of my corporate clients, they're all using Office. They're all using Windows on the back end. They're probably running SQL Server. They've got hardware. They've got an Exchange Server. Okay. 
But is Microsoft a really consumer-oriented brand? Right? How many of you are using Windows mobile devices right now? Anyone? Okay, so just a few hands. Right? I saw a statistic the other day from a TED Talk that back in 1998, something like 97% of all internet devices ran on Windows. Guess what that number is now? Anyone? It's something like 46%, and it's going down. So think about it. Microsoft was an incredibly successful company, but it was unable to cannibalize itself. Again, don't cry for Microsoft. They're still making a lot of money. But Microsoft isn't one of the companies that everyone is buzzing about. In fact, Microsoft is opening up, I believe, 75 retail stores. And I'll bet you a Coke that you're not going to have the same energy in a Microsoft store that you do in a Mac store. OK? So Microsoft really struggled changing course. In fact, Microsoft did some interesting things with the tablet. But ultimately, there was a great article on CNET recently about internally Microsoft killing the tablet. Because there were people who said, how does this help Windows and Office? And the, the short answer was, it doesn't. Okay? So the innovator's dilemma. Google became a platform. How? We know why, but how did this happen? Okay. Google added. Maps and Docs and Plus and Blogger and YouTube and more products than I could possibly count. Okay? In other words, Google became a platform. Single purpose companies are really at risk. Again, going back to Netflix, let's say that you're Netflix and let's say you hadn't even messed up with pricing, right? And your stock went down by, what was it, 50% in your Hastings and you lost billions of dollars. Okay? You're still a standalone service. Well, think about it for a second. What is Amazon doing with movies? Getting into the business. Apple with iCloud. Anyone know on YouTube now, you can actually watch movies like The Godfather. They just signed up, um, I can't believe I know this, Ashton Kusher, Madonna, and I think it was Jay-Z, to provide original content. And we know that Apple's going after TV. So Google understood where things are going, and they diversified. They added different planks to their platform. Okay? And it keeps doing it. Okay? So that's Google. Let's take a step back. What do App Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google have in common? Many things. And this is why it's not the smallest book in the world. Okay? First up, as we've seen, they frequently add planks to their platforms. Again, if you go back to, say, 1995, when Jeff Bezos founded Amazon.com, it was basically an online bookstore. And it was obviously a very profitable one. But I would argue now, as I do in the book, that Amazon has become a platform because you've got Kindle and Fire and you can watch movies and music. And in fact, Amazon is dis disintermediating the publishing industry. Anyone ever hear of Seth Godin? Okay, Really smart guy. He started with Amazon, the Domino Project, and he's released 12 best-selling books. Tim Ferriss, 4-Hour uh, Work Week, 4-Hour Diet. He just signed up to publish with Amazon. So not only is Amazon selling stuff, it's now letting people create stuff. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about another example. So Amazon has embraced this notion of a platform. And it's an important thing because IT has been consumerized. Right? There's a very famous expression, the consumerization of IT. You know, back in the mid-1990s, when I kind of got my start in consulting in the IT world, I used the best technology available to me at work. And now, when I go to a lot of my clients, this iPhone trumps what they're using at their desk. So IT has really been consumerized. The beauty of the platform is that you can actually take it with you. You don't have to tell someone, yeah, I'll, I'll respond to your email or to your instant message when I get back home. As long as you have Wi-Fi or an internet connection, you're OK. So first, these companies have added different planks to their platforms. And as I said, more consumer than business oriented. That doesn't mean that you can't use Facebook for work right, and have a fan page. Right? And in Google, just announced this with Plus, you can have the equivalent. Right? But from fundamentally, these are consumer oriented. And in fact, we've seen the rise of, I didn't coin the term, but the prosumer, basically a consumer who can produce quality content. Right? And I'm not just talking about cat videos on YouTube. I'm talking about professional level podcasts or videos or blog posts. Right? If you want to put out a book, use Amazon CreateSpace. You can have a relatively professional book. Okay, these are consumer-oriented. Next up, they are rooted in emerging technologies. All these companies use the cloud. Now, they use it in different ways, but they understand that they don't want you to have to remember to update your Facebook status or your Google Plus status when you go back home. Why not do it with you? 
Okay? So they're using the cloud, they're using mobilities, they've got the open APIs or application programming interfaces, they've got SDKs or software development kits. I was actually just watching a TED video the other day at the airport flying in here. There's a 12-year-old kid who's got three apps in the App Store. And he's talking about how he taught himself Perl and Python and PHP, but then he downloaded an SDK and started creating apps. And he had to convince his parents to spend $99 to get approved to go in the App Store. So again, this is a fundamentally different way of doing business. And you take away these technologies and these companies can't build their platforms. So you've got three things in common, at least. And with a nod to Steve Jobs, one more thing. Iconic leaders. This is taken from that cover of Fast Company, right? Does anyone not recognize anyone here? OK. It's uh, unbelievable to me how much these companies have done through the leadership of these four people. And when I think about some of the companies that are trying to copycat the Gang of Four, I, I kind of chuckle. When Rupert Murdoch bought MySpace, was that three years ago or something? Does anyone really confuse him with Mark Zuckerberg? Right? He's old school media. There's nothing wrong with M Rupert Murdoch, right? I know he has his own uh, troubles now with, with the hacking thing in England, but again, he's not a visionary leader, right? You can't just put a leader in front of a company and all of a sudden everything's fixed, okay? So these companies have these cultures there. I've, I've talked to people at Amazon and, and Apple and Facebook and Google, and the things they're doing are amazing. They're not democracies. Okay, they don't have steering committees all the time. In fact, one of the first things that Larry Page did when he took over as CEO for Eric Schmidt, and I think it was early June, was to reorganize things. Okay, he thought they were becoming too bureaucratic. In the age of the platform, speed kills. You can't sit there and debate, right? This isn't a democracy. In fact, I just got an email from a friend of mine. There's a company now over in England that has an 18-month plan to eliminate internal emails. Not, not external, right, if you have to talk to clients, but internally, because they feel like most of it's just a waste of time. So these companies rely upon different tools and technologies, and that's why they can move so quickly. So I want to talk a little bit about building platforms, because not everyone agrees with me in this book. In fact, I've, I've done a few interviews. The book's only been out for six weeks, and some people have said, are you telling me that my 10-person business can learn something from Google? Come on, they're Google. I'm you know, a 10-person company with two million revenues. And I say yes, because anyone can build a platform. Okay. There's no one right way, and this is critical. If you take a look at just, say, Amazon and Facebook, the way they built their platforms is totally different. Who was around for the, the dot-com boom back in 97, 98? Okay, I'm dating myself. Okay. What did Amazon do, other than lose a lot of money? Okay. Jeff Bezos irritated the hell out of pundits, out of some of his stockholders, because he didn't care about making what he, profits. He, in fact, I just read a book called One Click about Jeff Bezos, and he was quoted as saying, trying to make profits short term is the stupidest thing I can do. He was all about getting big fast. That was his mantra, right? Because I want to be the world's biggest bookstore. I want to take advantage of the long tail from Chris Anderson. I want everyone to find every book possible on Amazon, and that costs money. So he was all about getting big fast. Now, he was a, Amazon was a publicly traded company, so he had access to funds that, say, Facebook didn't. Now, the way that Facebook built its platform, I would argue, is fundamentally different. It was not about getting big fast. There's an excellent book by David Kirkpatrick called The Facebook Effect, which was sort of the basis for the social network, the movie. I, I like the movie, but the book is phenomenal. Because in a movie, right, they're not going to go into the ins and outs of servers and data centers, right? But that was actually a real issue for Facebook. In fact, if you go back to 2004, 2005, when Facebook was starting to become popular, remember at that point, Facebook wasn't open to most of the people here, right? You needed an EDU domain on your email address. Otherwise, you couldn't have a Facebook account, right? So Facebook was becoming very popular. And there were schools clamoring for it. Zuckerberg would get emails. When are we getting Facebook? When are we getting Facebook? He wasn't about getting big fast. Why? Who remembers Friendster? Okay, Friendster was a great idea, right? I can connect with my friends from high school and college. Sound familiar? What was the problem with Friendster? Basically, scale. Okay, it would take two or three minutes for a page to load, and back then people weren't that patient. Never mind today. Okay, so Facebook took a very different approach. In fact, I would argue Facebook will probably go public 
couple, for a couple of reasons. A, because it will have to through SEC regulations and the number of people who own private shares, but B, because it wants the capital to make some of the acquisitions that right now it can't necessarily make. So there isn't one right way to build a platform. But if you take a look at these four companies like I had in writing the book, they do some things the same way. Scale, experimentation, and speed are absolutely critical. And I want to talk for a little bit about Twitter. Because back in 2009, Twitter was down all the time, if you remember. Okay, why? Because Twitter was starting to become extremely popular. There's a concept that I talk about in the book called network effects. In other words, if you're the only person with, say, a fax machine, well, what's the point? Right? or the only person with a cell phone, right? or the only person with email. But once everybody has it, the value of that network grows exponentially. So it's easier, bottom line, for Facebook to add its second and third and fourth million people than it is to add its first. But in order for that to happen, you have to be able to scale. So going back to Twitter, Twitter was starting to experience network effects in 2009. And Twitter, behind the scenes, was running an open source database management system called Ruby on Rails. And Ruby on Rails was fairly robust. Okay, but what happened? Well, no one had ever tried Ruby on Rails with 50 million people, some of whom may be tweeting 10 times a day. So Twitter, to its credit, had to make a decision. What do we want to do? If we want to sell out, right, say Google, we want to be a plank in Google's platform, then we should do it. But if we want to be a standalone company, if we want to be a platform that can scale, we have to blow up our infrastructure. So that's what they did. And they actually implemented a new system called Scala, which I don't know if it's like this for a reason, but it scales much better. So as a result, Twitter was able to handle, I think the still standing record is 493 tweets per second after Michael Jackson died. But Twitter wasn't in position to do that before. So scale is absolutely critical. Now let's talk about experimentation. Okay, and I want to focus for a minute on Google+. Some people are amazed at Google+, right? But does anyone think that that's actually Google's first attempt to build a social plank? No, in fact, it's its fourth, at least, to my knowledge. First off was Orkut, right, which for some reason was only popular in Brazil. I actually have a friend in Brazil, and I asked him why is Orkut popular, and he just, I have no idea. Okay? Then you had Google Wave, which was kind of cool, but a little confusing, right? You had a whole bunch of different features. It was kind of like Twitter, it was kind of like collaboration software, but that didn't take off. And then you had Google Buzz. And if you remember Google Buzz, in comparison to Plus, Google changed its mindset. With Google Buzz, Google assumed that if you four people are sitting together and you email each other, you all want to share the same stuff with each other, okay? But Google would do that automatically, and all of a sudden you'd say, wait a minute, why am I sharing it with this guy? Okay, so with Google Plus and Circles, Google said, yeah, we overreached. We don't want to automatically include you because we can look through your emails and figure out the people with whom you're communicating. We'll let you opt in. We'll gently suggest. Right? That because the four of you sit together, maybe you'll get along, but we're not going to do it for you. Okay, so Google isn't been afraid to experiment and fail. And in the age of the platform, you can't possibly have a five-year plan. One of the quotes in the book is from Jerry Brown, who was the California governor for a while. The quote is, planning is what everyone likes to do because no one has to do anything. Right? I, I chuckle when I hear about companies and they have these five-year plans. Really? Do you, do you really know where the world is going to be in five years? I, I don't. Right? But the beauty of the platform is that you don't have to predict the future. You build the planks so when the future arrives, you're more prepared. Perfect example, Amazon. This year is going to make, unbelievably, $750 million in essentially pure profit from selling excess compute power. Because when Amazon was building up its servers and its data centers, it embraced this notion of having too much is better than not having enough. Because right? if you can't find your book, you're not going to buy it, you're going to go to a competition, et cetera, et cetera. So Amazon realized, well, we don't really need all this. And cloud computing was becoming more popular. Amazon said, well, why don't we sell it? And four years later, Amazon's going to make nearly a billion dollars from it. And they're saying by 2014, it could be two and a half billion dollars. So again, you put yourself in position to succeed. Okay? And then speed. Facebook doesn't really ask for permission to do a lot of things. I'm not saying it's good or bad. Google sometimes will make some changes. Um, to its algorithm, which will ir irritate the hell out of SEO of people who make a lot of money by getting you in the top 10 of results. I would argue that the cost today of inaction exceed the costs of action. Okay? Sometimes you make a big mistake, you can get in trouble, but think about it. If you're going to wait six months to see if social networking and media are still going to be important, you could already be dead. The thing that scares Google the most 
aside from Facebook specifically, but in general is social search. Because, perfect example, I bought my MacBook Pro about a year ago. I didn't go to Google. I went to Facebook and I asked my friends, I'm thinking of getting a Mac, what do you think? And 14 people responded within an hour, you're a geek, you'll love it. And they were right, I do. So that's one search that I did on Facebook that I wouldn't do on Google. Now if that happens millions and millions of times, all of a sudden, if Facebook is a one plank company, I'm sorry, Google is a one plank company, then it's at risk. So speed is absolutely essential these days. Again, it's really critical to add these new and popular planks. You can't wait around to see if social media is going to go away, right? Now, you're Google, you have these resources, okay? But the same principle remains for any other company. It is not terribly expensive to add some of these planks and to use existing platforms as planks in your own. There is a reason that Google has an official Facebook page or an official Twitter feed, and not just for the company, but even for Google Offers. I think it's at Google Offers. Right? Or Amazon has its own YouTube channel. Right? Could Amazon build its own video network? Sure, maybe it will one day. But the point is, people are watching videos on YouTube. Why not have something come up that would attract their attention? Again, it isn't just about building a platform. It's about taking a look at existing platforms and seeing if they could be planks in your own. And like I said, the gang of four cross-pollinates. It's about being where the conversation is happening. Okay, just because you don't maintain a Facebook presence doesn't mean that people aren't talking about your company right now. Right? It's a very old school line of thought. So, let's take a little bit of a look at platforms then and now, because I'm the first person to admit that I think is, this is the only book out there that looks at Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google in this way, but platforms as we know them have actually been around for a long time. So platforms in the 90s were very different than platforms today. And this is going to get into my discussion in a bit about ecosystems. Okay? Because of broadband, because of open source, because of open APIs and SDKs, it is possible now for companies to build things on top of Facebook. Okay? We see that all the time. Or to use the Google API for, say, maps to build uh, an application like FlightAware. My last book was called The New Small, and I interviewed a company called Chaotic Moon, and the founder of this guy, William Hurley. And one of his clients went to him and said, yeah, we built this app for tracking flights, but quite frankly, it sucks. And it only had one star reviews in the app store. So his company reworked it, integrated it with the API for Google Maps, and now it's one of the best-selling apps out there. Now, that's just one example of an API from Google Maps, but this is happening time and time again. Okay, I can integrate Facebook into the website for this book or my, my home page installing the Facebook like button. I can have people tweet directly there. So all this is happening in this incredible spider web. These ecosystems now are so much more robust and they change so quickly. And anyone can be a part of them. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about ecosystems and external innovation. And here's where I'm going to have a little bit of fun. Okay, platforms today hinge on the strengths of their ecosystems. I I'm amazed that people say, oh yeah, we want to build a platform. Okay, great. Who's going to use it? Who's going to take it in different directions? Companies for many years have struggled with this notion of not invented here. Right? Uh, AT&T, I want to say in 1998, spent something like $20 million developing its own browser. My simple question is why? Okay, why do I need to reinvent the wheel? The better option is to put something out there and let people play with it. Right? Look at WordPress, which has anyone heard of WordPress? Content management system runs a ridiculous number of the top thousand sites on the web. Yeah, TechCrunch and HuffPo, right? Now, WordPress started, and, and that absolutely is a platform, as a fork of something called CafeLog. Okay? So if something is good, you can take it and move it in different directions. And WordPress, we could talk a lot about, but is this amazing ecosystem of developers. I mean, the things you can do with WordPress are absolutely amazing. So the stronger the ecosystem, the stronger the platform. One of the challenges that Research in Motion, RIM, has is not that it's bad technology, right? The apps that you use for the BlackBerry, I had a BlackBerry up until about three months ago, aren't nearly as good as an Android or as an Apple phone, okay? So ecosystems are absolutely huge. It's not about just the technology, it's about what you can do with the technology. Okay, so you want these ecosystems. You want 
partners and developers, users, customers, communities, you want people out there extending your platform. You want people to say, oh, I didn't know you can do that, or there's an app for that, or, you know, I, I mean, I'm talking to people all the time, and I'm saying, well, what apps do you use? In fact, if I see someone with an iPhone, I'll often go to the person, what's your favorite app? And it's amazing the things you can learn. That kind of organic marketing is happening everywhere these days. In the age of the platform, it is not about top down. I mean, one of the most important things to happen to Google, I argue in the book, is that it became a verb. The Oxford English Dictionary recognized it, and I think it was 2001 or 2002. It became a verb. Oh, just Google it. That is amazing. It's a lot different when that's bottom up than when you see these Microsoft commercials trying to tell you to bing it. It just doesn't have the same impact. So these ecosystems promote all of this external innovation. And I want to have some fun. Okay? In order to make these ecosystems chime, you have to give them incentives. There's basically a 70-30 split at the Gang of Four. For my last book, The New Small, I created an app with the help of a development company. So when that app sells, it's a 99 cent out, let's just call it a dollar for the sake of argument, 70% goes to me, 30% goes to Apple. Okay, same thing with Facebook credits. If you buy virtual goods on Zynga, right, the Facebook credits is basically a 70-30 split for the developer. Okay, if I sell my books on Amazon, let's say the Kindle version is 10 bucks, Amazon keeps three. Okay, so you have to give people incentives. It's not just about saying, will you please build for our platform, because the hot developers can really go wherever they want, right? And the hot developers these days really don't want to work at AOL or Yahoo or MySpace, right? They want to work at companies like Zynga or the Gang of Four, okay? Next up. It's incentives are not enough. I can say, hey, we're going to give you all this money if you do this stuff. That's all fine and dandy. Where are the tools? This is where the APIs and the SDKs come into play. Okay, if you don't make these things available, how can people extend your platform? That doesn't mean that every company needs to develop an API or an SDK, but you have to be thinking about tools there. That's why if you take a look at a company like Oracle, which runs a ridiculous number of the backend and database systems for companies around the world, I don't really consider it a true platform because are other people externally developing for it, okay? So let's see some of these ecosystems in action. And we'll play a little bit of trivia here, too. Does anyone recognize this guy? Who is it? Jo uh, just, uh, Jordan Rudess. And Jordan Rudess is a fascinating story. I actually hung out with him a couple days ago in San Diego. He's a keyboardist for one of my favorite bands, Dream Theater. And this guy is off the charts talented. He went to the Juilliard School of Music around here when he was nine years old. Okay? The guy is so talented, if you gave him a soda can, he would turn it into an instrument and play it. And he'd record it on YouTube and get it up there. The guy is so talented. So when he's on stage for Dream Theater playing to five or 10,000 people, okay, he's actually demonstrating one of his, say, three apps he's playing on stage. His latest one is called Geosynthesizer. Now, there are plenty of people in the audience who are musicians and go, what is he doing when he's playing his iPad? And they want to buy that app. So he's actually marketing for Apple just while he's playing in the band. Okay, and this is just one person. Now, he might sell a decent number of apps, but there are something like 500 apps in the App Store. Again, the ecosystem is in action. This is great marketing for Apple, even though Apple really does anything directly to do with the concert. Okay, next up. Anyone recognize this woman? This is Amanda Hawking, and she's become sort of a self-publishing rock star. She sold something like $1 million worth of these teen vampire Twilight e-books. Not my cup of tea. So she sold so many of them. She made a $1 million. 300000 or so went to Amazon. Okay? She's become so popular that she just signed a four-book, $2 million deal with, I want to get this right, St. Martin's Press. She's become a rock star off of the Google platform. She's part of that ecosystem. And she had to ask herself. Most people say, but you know, you're a young woman. She's probably 27, 20 years old. You have to think about a $2 million deal. Yes, she did, because she can sell her e-books on Amazon without the help of a big publisher. OK? Next up, you might recognize this guy. You might not like him either. Anyone? Mark Pincus. He's the reason that some of you in your Facebook feeds get all these Mafia War updates, okay? Because his company, Zynga, builds all of these apps on top of the Facebook platform. So some people say, is he crazy? Because if Facebook were to cut off Zynga, then his company would be in a lot of trouble, okay? 
Well, yes and no. First of all, Zynga is developing its own platform. Second, Zynga, based on the success of Google+, Plus, is trying to work with Google. But also, think about it, Facebook really wouldn't want to cut that off because that's a huge stream of revenue for Facebook. So in the age of the platform, it is very common to have these, I don't want to say uneasy, but you know, potentially tenuous situations. Okay? You don't really want to go to war with people. But one of my favorite quotes in the book is Bugs Bunny, quoting from Groucho Marx. Of course, you realize this means war. We are going to see in the next year and beyond these platforms consistently colliding. And we're seeing it right now, right? Everyone wants to get into music, right? Google just launched mu Google Music a couple of uh, weeks ago, right? To compete possibly with iTunes. Amazon lets you listen to music and watch movies in the cloud. So we're seeing that these platforms are evolving and they're colliding, okay? That's why when I saw that Fast Company issue and the question was who will win the great tech war of 2012, I don't think that anyone will win it, right? Will Amazon become more social than Facebook? I don't see how that's possible, okay? But if you look at Amazon or Apple, they have embraced social networking to some extent, right? It, iTunes added Ping a couple years ago, which, so you can like a Dream Theater song, right? And you can communicate with other people who like that song. Uh, with Amazon, you can review books, which I would argue is inherently social. There's the like button hint on the page of this book on Amazon. Okay, so these platforms have embraced these different social elements. So I want to save a little bit of time for questions. Uh, if you want to find out about me, here's all my information. But uh, do we have time for a few? Uh, we actually don't. Let's give him a round of applause, my friends. We love him. He's staying during the break. If you have questions.